All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I know we have people still signing on here, but um, we want to get going. So welcome to today's In Good Company event. We're excited for the opportunity to discuss trends, sip a little coffee, and tell you a bit more about how NetSuite and Adaptologics are helping businesses just like yours accelerate growth. And in doing so, we'll be joined by three amazing speakers. We have Dr. Roddy O'Connor, Research Assistant Professor at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine Center for Cellular Immunotherapies, as well as Steve Godin, Senior Vice President of Forge Biologics, and Audrey Greenberg, Chief Business Officer and Co-Founder of Discovery Labs. And I wanna start off by looking at our agenda for the next hour. So. Um, we'll start off with Dr. Roddy O'Connor's keynote, then we'll move on to Steve Godin's keynote, then Audrey, and then at the very end, we're going to open up to a Q&A from all of you. So I want to remind you to use that Q&A button there on the bottom of your screen to ask any questions you have throughout today's keynote. And our Q&A moder moderator, Cece Andrews, will open it up to all of you at the end of the discussion before we get into brewing with Miranda from the Greater Goods Coffee Roasters. That'll happen at the end of today's event. We'll sip a little coffee. So a lot to come, a lot of exciting stuff here. Um, so please join me in a very warm, albeit virtual, welcome for Dr. Roddy O'Connor. Thank you so much, Kendall. Uh, great to be here today and talking about all the kind of you know next generation and transformative events for uh, CAR T cells. So I'll really focus my talk on CAR T cells today. It's really a form that more emerges in you know, cell and gene therapies. So what are CAR T cells? We can go to a little introductory slide. So consider CAR T cells. Um, it's really this, you know, uh, process where T cells are isolated from patients, and we envision these T cells as soldiers. So one of the goals is to, you know, get these soldiers in our hands and expand them in nutrient and, and oxygen-rich conditions in the hood. So remove them from the body from a patient with cancer per se, where there's you know, immunosuppressive features ongoing that you know, inhibit or impair growth of the cell. So we try and build up the numbers in a nutrient-rich condition, you know, such as a tissue culture incubator. Um, and, and of course, you know, we introduce a weapon in the form of the car, which is just really a synthetic receptor to the T cell, which will really, you know, redirect the specificity or overcome the ability of tumor cells to evade detection. So once we expand the numbers of the cells and envision this like a task force, the soldiers are reinfused back in through uh, doctor transfer back to the patient where they can, you know, find and destroy the tumor cells. So we can go to the next slide, please, Cece. So there are several parameters that would influence the efficacy of CAR T cells. And you know, my lab is specifically interested in, you know, I suppose T cells for solid tumors. We're trying to extend really that therapeutic potential from blood-based malignancies to solid tumors, and various you know, parameters will affect this. But one of the things we like to think of is this is central crux that occurs. And that's T cells can often traffic to solid tumors and you know, traverse solid tumors and undergo antigenic stimulation, but they really sit alongside the tumor cells and they're not functionally competent. They're not killing the cells. And if you isolate the T cells and put them in nutrient rich conditions, you can kind of you know, reestablish or reverse any dysfunction and they once again kill you know, these tumor cells. So there's something hostile in that environment that's inhibitory to the cells. So one of the challenges is what kind of qualities can we confer to the cell that'll make it better when it's traversing these hostile environments? We can go to the next slide. So this is really, you know, one of the, the central focuses of my lab is this, this theme of faster, higher, stronger. Um, There's really a renewed interest in looking at the role of metabolism and metabolic reprogramming for boosting the, the function of CAR T cells. And, and really what I look at is during the ex vivo expansion phase. So as we kind of get our hands on the soldiers and culture them in nutrient rich conditions, 
are there, you know, approaches either genetic or through conditioning strategies through optimizing pool selection? Think of your perfect brew. Um, or, you know, building cells with superior you know, energy generating capacity, mitochondrial function, and being able to kind of, you know, um, buffer or endure these harsh environments, which are acidic, lots of oxidative stress and loss. So what can we do? So we can go to the next slide. So, you know, one of the themes, and, you know, my original background is in stem cell biology, so I love this, uh, this kind of slide, um, where if you look across, you know, really any kind of cell therapy, you know, there's this idea of you have these either tissues for stem cells or arms for cell stem cells. We culture them ex vivo blood, um, for 10 to 14 days. And what happens is the T cells are activated, and they're activated so we can deliver the synthetic receptor, the CAR transgene, and expand it over a number of days. But interestingly, as we do this, we think we're doing good to the cell, but we're actually triggering an order differentiation process, you know, in our hands for 14 days. This is counterintuitive. As we differentiate the cells, they become exhausted and more fatigued, and we're really putting in an inferior cell product called the adaptive transfer. So this is one of the kind of transformative aspects that I alluded to on the first slide uh, for cell therapy, that, that maybe what we're doing is not the best approach. Respond to antigen positive tumor cells and kill them, and, and then you know divide to give these long-lasting central memory cells, which is the long-lasting you know, you know, unity. Hi, Dr. O'Connor. I apologize for jumping in here. Um, it sounds like there's some wind picking up in your audio. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, let me move. I'll, I'll move. No okay, is that, is that better? That is better. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, so the idea of, you know, a differentiation, you know, ex vivo, it may be not optimal or suboptimal for the T cells. So let's go to the next slide. Yeah, so, so once again, you know, what's done around all the centers for CAR T cells may not be the best approach. And we had a paper um, published earlier last year showing that it's really reminiscent of, you know, cell culture media was designed in the 1960s for the goal of just proliferating numbers of cells. And well, now we know the capacity of cells is not the best determinant of efficacy for CAR T cells, or probably any stem cells. Quality of the cell is the best. Even if you have one good cell, that will give rise and support, you know, progeny and provide to give you the best type of cell. So, what we look at here is, you know, when we get our hands on cells, what is the, the optimal medium? So, so, there's a whole range of studies on this showing that you know, intermittent fasting for T cells or glucose deprivation gives rise to better cells. Factors such as changing out proteins, such as serum. So, we know there's going to be declining human serum availability for the clinical trials in the years to come. We're looking at serum alternatives. This will be very important. And, and any other conditioning factors that would allow the cell to overcome the safe so we'll go to the next slide. So, so a little, you know, uh, finding the perfect brew. So this is really adding conditioning factors to the media to get an optimal media. Once again, to optimize the fuel selection. So we favor the xenograft models where we can expand CAR T cells over a number of days and actually test their anti-tumor function. This is just an example where we adjusted the subtle adaptation where we Removed serum and replaced it with physiologics, the serum alternative, expanded the cells. We're able to show a graph on the bottom left where we look at the burden on the y axis. We really think the focus on is really the stress test, stress test model where we used a very low amount of CAR T cells, so 0.75 by 10 700, 750,000 cells. We can see that the standard condition of CAR T cells grown in a, a normal standard brew, per se, of the, the media. Is a, it's really an inferior product, it can't control tumor burden. You can see that by the gradients on the y axis. But we can optimize anti tumor function by 
subtle adaptation of the traditional factor affecting the very One more slide, then, just to, to... Roddy, it's kind of hard to hear you. I don't know if you want to take your earbuds out of the computer and just try the computer audio. Sorry to interrupt. How is that? Oh, so much better. <laughs> Okay, so this is kind of, um, this was the, the, the elixir. So can we get more for less in terms of CAR T cell therapies? And this is work by Dr. Gassemi, which is under revision at Nature Bio. Um, the first slide I alluded to was the approach in general where CAR T cells are isolated and expanded ex vivo for 14 days. What if we totally, you know, remove this aspect? Is there a way to you know, optimize conditioning factors um, just to, to, to get the CAR into non-activated T cells. So really to eliminate the activation step that would trigger differentiation. So we avoid this differentiation and, you know, exhaustion ex vivo, just get a non-activated T cell, allow the CAR to, you know, be introduced or delivered to the T cell and 24 hours later, introduce it back into a host. And, and this is once again, realizing you know, enhanced potency of cells where we don't fatigue the cells or exhaust the cells over 14 days. So this is really the elixir where you're getting more for less. We're doing less. It's a less manufacturing costs. It's less time for those patients with, you know, rapidly progressive disease. You know, they get the cells back within 24 hours. So, so this was really, I think this is going to be very transformative in the years to come for CAR T cell therapies. And, and that's really, you know, that, that's the, the hitting home point there, the, the, the last slide. And, and happy as people ask questions on the chat or contact me by email, I can answer any questions, okay? Thank you so much, Dr. O'Connor. Before we move on to the next keynote, uh, we have a video from Adaptologics. So after this plays, uh, we will hear from Steve. Thank you all. Adaptologics is the only NetSuite partner established exclusively for biotech and pharmaceutical companies. Pharmaceutical companies once had three options for managing business processes, an expensive tier one solution, a one size fits all patch that fell short in critical areas, or a solution of their own, built from disjointed applications that isolated essential data. As ex pharma industry staff, Adaptologics founders needed to be the change. Instead of suffering a narrow marketplace, they developed the much needed solution. Many years later, Adaptologics is the single largest NetSuite partner, bridging data gaps between financials, outsourced supply chains, GMP manufacturing, and 3PLs. Pre-revenue pharmaceutical companies now have templatized solutions for commercialization and beyond. After dozens of recurrent implementations for each solution, Adaptologics has templatized modules for pharma and biotech of every size and phase. Schedule a demo to learn more. And now we will hear our second keynote from Steve Godin. Thank you so much. Thanks and uh, good afternoon or perhaps morning, wherever you're at. Uh, I'm Steve Godin, Senior Vice President of Finance. You can probably tell by the gray hair that um, I've been around for a little while, uh, have relatively new to the biotech space though, only about the last decade. Uh, of my business career. Prior to that, it was in a variety of different industries, uh, probably the closest uh, in terms of uh, being able to relate to biotech was in the chemical business. Uh, but uh, I have uh, recently, last fall, joined Forge 
uh, after leaving Aviona Therapeutics and uh, Forge is uh, a developing CDMO uh, that will help manufacture AAV for clients uh, from preclinical all the way through the uh, commercial stages uh, of their programs. And uh, we are uh, a relatively new company. We formed in 2020. Uh, we raised about $40 million uh, at the onset of the pandemic and uh, very recently have just closed our Series B round uh, where we were able to bring in another $120 million. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about what we're going to do with uh, all of the funds that we've managed to raise during uh, this really extraordinary time. If you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is really the reason why we got involved uh, with the venture. And for those of you who don't know, I am not on the science side. Uh, I am on the business side. And these graphs were really what excited me. Uh, about the opportunity in this space, because uh, despite the great work uh, of companies, and Audrey is certainly gonna tell you about a great company in the space, uh, Discovery Labs after I'm done, the capacity to handle the demand for cell and gene therapy um, is, is so short and the demand continues to grow that we saw a, a great opportunity to come and, and try to narrow that gap and to join the ranks of a great company like Discovery Labs by forming Forge and filling the gaps, if you would, by being able to help clients who would otherwise have to wait very long uh, to have their therapies produced. Uh, and so that's really what our intention is for joining the space and uh, our invent our investors were equally impressed with what the uh, opportunity is here in this space and so this really was the impetus for getting us involved uh, and you can see on the second graph on the right even after companies like ours uh, and others who are in the space continue to develop uh, their capacity there's still such a great demand out there that uh, it will likely be about the time my grandchildren uh, are entering the business world that uh, this really curve is going to narrow. Uh, so if you could get us to the next slide, please. Uh, and this really kind of brings the point home even more. Uh, it, it shows you really how many preclinical uh, programs that are out there, uh, how many clinical ones are, and I'll draw your attention to the 8 billion that has been invested in gene therapy companies just in the first half of 2020. Um, this is a, a really exciting industry and a lot of investors are excited by the premise and the promise that it brings to bring treatments to so many patients, many of whom are underserved. Uh, and so what Forge is doing is trying to fill the gaps uh, to try to help some of those therapies get to the patients who desperately need them. Uh, it's not just as easy though as uh, leasing a building and buying some equipment and turning it on and making it happen. Uh, it's very expensive uh, as anyone who has lived through the process can tell you, it's, it's very capital intensive. More importantly, it's complex. Uh, it's, it's not like baking a cake where you can just follow the Betty Crocker recipe. There's a, a lot of nuance and a lot of complexity that's required and thus really great experience is required to be successful in this business. Um, and there's not a tremendous amount of experience out there. It's really focused um, in some, some tight areas. And uh, at Forge, we're very, very fortunate to have been able to uh, have been founded by and have attracted some terrific uh, expertise and great experience uh, so that we'll be able to provide some of that uh, material and produce 
the promises that patients are really uh, desiring and in great need of. Next slide, please. Um, this is the facility that we have uh, leased. It's just south of Columbus. Uh, and Columbus is really what I would call the Midwest leader for gene therapy. Uh, you can see some of the other companies who have already set up shop in Columbus. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a very affordable uh, and, and it has a terrific, uh, terrific quality of life. Uh, and it's, uh, it's just a great Midwestern city for us uh, in, in addition to the high, high quality of life, it's a low cost of living. So a lot of folks who have experience in the field that we're recruiting from the coasts, they can't believe how far their dollars will go uh, in the Midwest and in particularly uh, in the uh, central Ohio region of Columbus and, and surrounding areas. Next slide, please. That's just an aerial view of the facility. Uh, it's 175,000 square feet uh, and it's a nice high roof line, uh, which means we can get all of our HVAC underneath it. And those on the business side realize that when you're in a Midwestern market where you do get some occasional snow, uh, being able to put your equipment underneath the roof is, is particularly helpful. Um, you'll notice there's some green space Beyond that, uh, we also have some future plans to develop. Uh, and fortunately, uh, the landlord that we're with uh, owns some of the other surrounding buildings. And as we grow and need additional expansion beyond this, uh, we'll be able to stay uh, right in the, the neighborhood here, so to speak, uh, and hopefully ultimately develop a campus that you'll uh, you'll see very similar to what uh, Audrey's gonna tell us about uh, coming up here. Next slide. Uh, once we uh, complete all of our interior construction, uh, which we have staged out, uh, you'll be able to see uh, the different components here. Uh, we'll have uh, 45 clean rooms, uh, and it'll really be from start to start to finish, pun intended, as uh, we'll be able to uh, uh, both start the process and then do the fill finish. Uh, for our uh, for all of our clients and, and those in the preclinical stage through right through the commercial stage. Next slide, please. And uh, so you don't have to listen to me babble all the time. Uh, we've got a short video that our uh, director of communications has put together. During the first few months of 2021, we've had some big changes at our home, the hearth. Our aim is to bring transformative gene therapies to patients with rare disease, and we've brought that same transformation to our facility. Construction of our first four GMP suites is nearly completed, with priority manufacturing slated to begin in Q3. With walkable ceilings and fully accessible utility systems, our space is easy to maintain and upgrade reducing downtimes in production, and ensuring that we're ready to adapt our space to meet our clients' needs in an ever-evolving industry. We've been expanding not only our manufacturing capabilities, but also our team. Our Forge family will be over 100 strong within the next few months. That's a family of hardworking, open, purpose-driven, and engaged people. And we're aiming everything that we have towards bringing hope and healing to those impacted by rare disease. With an experienced team and a mission that runs deep, we are relentlessly building our capacity to serve patients and clients. So once again, the question is, you in? And, uh... I'll pick up with here. Here is uh, our leadership team, uh, first and foremost, led by uh, our one of our founders, Tim Miller. Uh, Tim has a tremendous experience uh, in the gene therapy space. 
as you can see. Uh, his co-founders are uh, Jason Eicholtz, uh, who uh, most recently uh, has done some terrific work at both Nationwide Children's, which is located very near where we're at, uh, as well as at Scout Bio, uh, and uh, Randy De Silva, who uh, migrated to us from uh, MyoNexus. Uh, additionally, our chief medical officer is world renowned for uh, some rare disease research that she has uh, developed, and that's uh, Dr. Maria Escalar. Our chief de technical officer, David Dismuk, uh, has joined us from great experience, re most recently at Stride Bio, uh, and also uh, prior to that, uh, the University of uh, North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and at Voyager. Uh, Magdalena Turpin, one of my former colleagues at Aviona has just recently joined us as head of business development. Chris Schilling came from Nationwide Children's and heads up all of our regulatory affairs. Uh, and my colleague, uh, Christina Perry, vice president of finance uh, and investor relations, brings terrific experience from both public accounting at Deloitte uh, and most recently after having served uh, as Drive Capital's CFO and brought a number of startups, uh, not only in the biotech space, but uh, in other markets, uh, helped them uh, come to fruition and come to market. Uh, and uh, you can see who our uh, top tier investors are uh, from RA Capital, uh, Zontogeny, Perceptive Advisors, Surveyor, Marshall Waste, uh, and uh, Octagon. Uh, so we have, and certainly don't want to forget uh, drive capital who made such uh, such an important uh, uh, investment in us early on. So that's our leadership team. And you can see that it's very solid in its experience in gene therapy. Next slide, please. Um, I'm not going to stay on this one too long. Uh, it's really helpful to our salespeople. And if you are interested, uh, please reach out to me and I will uh, put you in touch with them. Uh, but uh, we offer some flexible scheduling. Uh, we have open licensing and royalty-free usage of our proprietary ignition cells. Uh, our blaze vectors uh, have been uh, developed principally for uh, high yield and consistency. Uh, and again, on the R&D side, we're able to do end-to-end -end from research uh, right through uh, up to the commercial stage. Uh, and the facility, uh, the hearth, is uh, uh, CGMP compliant. Next slide, please. Um, and really, besides uh, our development work uh, for clients, uh, we like to say we eat our own dog food. Uh, and we do have some therapeutic uh, development of our own underway, which I won't get into. Uh, but it helps uh, keep our edges sharp. Uh, that way we know what our clients are going through uh, and we're then able to understand their issues and their problems uh, because we're encountering the same thing. Uh, but the, the key to us uh, is really the experience management and, and the experience scientific talent that we've been able to attract. Next slide, please. Um, and this basically goes a little bit toward what I was saying where we have several therapeutic subsidiaries uh, that will be focusing on uh, some rare diseases uh, in the gene therapy space. Uh, and again, this really will help us uh, continue to stay close in touch uh, with clients because we'll know uh, as, as being our subsidiaries being clients of us, we'll know the pitfalls uh, that they will be experiencing as, as we ourselves uh, extend into treating and coming up with treatments, uh, gene therapy treatments uh, for certain rare diseases. Next slide. Um, and this is just a final short video that I think uh, will uh, wrap up what my talk is. So if uh, you can go ahead and play this one.
So here we are, building a new company. What can clients expect when working with Forge Biologics? So I think our clients can expect that we understand. Uh, we understand what it's like to be on the other side as a client, because um, many of us have come from other gene therapy companies where we used external manufacturing groups to, to make our vector. Uh, and we also understand what it means for the company uh, to, to meet those corporate goals, and not just what's sort of mission critical for the company, but also what is critical for the patient make sure those therapies can get to the patient. And then very importantly, we understand how to make Vector. Uh, we've assembled a very talented team with decades of experience in manufacturing and testing of AEV, and we utilize that knowledge to make sure that we can go quickly and meet our clients' uh, goals, not just from a hands-on, but also from a, from a leadership perspective. And so we understand uh, what it takes and we know how to deliver. Thank you so much for sharing, Steve. And do you have any final remarks for your keynote? No, it's just uh, been uh, great to participate in this. Uh, we're actually uh, going through the implementation of NetSuite right now as we uh, really prepare to uh, launch our production. Uh, and uh, we're very, very pleased to have selected a great partner with uh, Adaptologics who has really brought their tremendous expertise and experience with the industry and is really helping us uh, design and implement uh, very, very effective processes. So uh, for those of you on the line who are evaluating systems, I can say as uh, someone who over 35 years, who has installed about a half a dozen different ERPs, uh, I think uh, you should look very, very carefully at NetSuite uh, and if you're in the uh, pharmaceutical or biotech space, uh, the partner that you'll want to select for NetSuite is Adaptologics. So I'd like to thank uh, everyone really for the opportunity of uh, presenting a little bit about Forge today and certainly would welcome many questions or uh, insights that people have. So thanks very much. Thank you, Steve. And next we will have uh, one more video from Adaptologics, and then we have our final keynote from Audrey Greenberg. As a pharmaceutical manufacturer, your job is incredibly complex. Your processes must fit within the parameters of each team's requirements while adhering to a laundry list of regulatory standards and considerations specific to your organization. But as a startup organization, you are also relatively small and lack the resources to immediately administer a legacy Tier 1 system. You're probably thinking that it shouldn't have to be so difficult to find the right solution, and we agree. That's why Adaptologics has developed the only complete GMP-compliant manufacturing system on NetSuite designed to scale with your organization to commercialization and beyond. From your onboarding, procurement, and WMS, to your manufacturing and final product release, Adaptologics equips manufacturers around the world with Tier 1 solutions and only 10% of the required resources, keeping you lightweight and expandable as you advance through clinical trials. As a pharmaceutical... And next, we will hear from Audrey Greenberg from the Discovery Labs. Thank you so much, Cece, and it was wonderful to hear Dr. O'Connor and Steve talk about their background and expertise. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to present here today about the Discovery Labs and the Center for Breakthrough Medicines. My background is similar to Steve's and that I also come from the business background and am learning the science uh, as we go, but it's been an amazing experience given all the transformative things that have been happening in the space. If you could advance a couple slides, that'd be great. Thank you, you can go one more. So um, I think Steve and Roddy did a great job of talking about what's happening in the space, but just for everyone, you can go back one, just for everybody's um, knowledge and expertise here in the room, it sounds like we have a group of people that come from pharmaceutical backgrounds, but just to highlight, there is really an amazing revolution occurring right now in medicine. 
We are moving from a one size fits all environment um, in terms of how we treat cancer and disease to precision medicine, where we're able to map the genome, identify the gene that's responsible for a certain disease, and actually repair that gene or replace it with a with a one with one that works. So that is just the tipping point of what's happening. And the way that we manufacture these therapies now is um, incredibly bespoke. But what we're working to do at Discovery Labs and the Center for Breakthrough Medicines is come up with platform technology that industrializes the manufacture of cell and gene therapies, which are really the next generation of medicine. And uh, Steve got into the supply and demand imbalance, but why is that? Why is there such a supply and demand imbalance? It's really a couple factors, both macroeconomic and technology that have led to these, this change. Uh, the first of which is the abundance of capital flowing into the space. Uh, there are unprecedented volumes in terms of M&A, IPO, and venture capital that are happening in our space, which is obviously a leading indicator that leads to um, a tremendous appetite for not just lab space, but also manufacturing services. Uh, the FDA is fast-tracking approvals at a faster and faster rate. You saw that with COVID and, and that's continuing in rare disease, uh, as well as for some wider spread indications. And um, supply chain disruptions have really led to the onshoring manufacturing that has only continued to create a strain on the system. Next slide. Thanks, Cece. Thank you. So this is quite dramatic. You'll see we've had the highest level ever in 2020 in terms of capital flowing into the space globally at 134 billion. Uh, next slide, please. And that continued in through the first quarter of 2021. Uh, we had a record breaking VC volume here. You see a nice graph uh, from PitchBook with 37 billion in uh, 2020 through to 12.2 billion annualized is the highest level ever in a quarter and annualized for the year. Uh, the deal count is also quite robust. Sometimes you'll see a few large deals that account for most of this, but that's not the case. The deal volume is also up as well. So it, it's been a very um, dynamic time in the industry. We're seeing a lot of young players being financed at very early stages. Company, companies are going public earlier. SPACs are very robust in the space. And there's been a lot of um, appetite for life science. And that was exacerbated by, the, exacerbated by the pandemic as well. Next slide, please. Here you'll see the unprecedented growth in terms of the number of cell and gene therapies in the pipeline. 700 times growth since 1995 in cell therapy, 10 times in gene therapy. Uh, and then you'll see two times and four times since 2015 for cell and gene respectively. There is an incredible amount of companies being formed, most of which in terms of the gene therapy space are coming out of University of Pennsylvania and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, which are based in, in obviously in Philadelphia in the community where we're based. And you'll see the facility behind me in my virtual background. But a lot of these um, new companies are being spun out of academia. Next slide, please. So why is ATMP or advanced therapy medicinal products, advanced therapy, cell and gene therapy, why, are, why is it so difficult to get access to manufacturing capacity? And Steve highlighted a couple key things, one of which is the cost to build these facilities, the amount of time it takes to locate a site, the amount of time it takes to zone the site and get approvals, um, and then obviously the building time, it, it, all of these building materials now are incredible, incredibly high demand and they're in short supply. You have to then build out the space and put the equipment in. All the equipment has very long lead times. And then you obviously have to put the people that know how to do it in the space and talent is in short supply. So a lot, you're seeing a lot of attention being paid to CDMOs because the expertise the facility, the equipment, the consumables, which are in short supply, are all there at the ready. Um, and you'll see that in terms of the CDMO cell and gene therapy space, the outsourcing rate for just viral vector is 88% in terms of both hybrid and in-house solely. 
or excuse me, outsource solely. And in cell therapy, it's at 55%. So the great majority of the manufacturing is done by outsource providers because of some of these gating items. And as I said earlier, uh, vaccine development even uh, put more strain on capacity of those looking to outsource. Uh, it's in short supply. Next slide, please. Manufacturing and CMC is really a key to cell and gene therapy success. You saw that in this past year, maybe you're knowledgeable about, there's been eight different therapies that have hit speed bumps with FDA approval. And those are mostly due to CMC issues, chemistry, manufacturing controls, which predominantly are development and manufacturing issues, mostly leading to um, assays and the ability to prove comparability between certain batches as products are produced. So you really, as an innovator company, have to get in front of those issues by getting GMP grade materials, processes, and analytical methods that can help your therapy speed the path to commercialization, not just from a regulatory perspective, but in other perspectives as well. Next slide, please. Uh, here you see an aerial of one of our sites uh, at the Discovery Labs. We have a million square feet here. This is the legacy GlaxoSmithKline research and development facility that we're transforming to GMP manufacturing. We have a central utility plant that you see in the back there, uh, which powers the entire site with redundancy, a tremendous amount. What, what's interesting about life science properties for those that don't know on the phone is the tremendous power, water, um, and lab system requirements that the property needs. You don't wanna be on day 14 of a 15 day batch and lose power. So you need redundancy, you need incredible amount of power, um, you need floor loading capacity. So these buildings have certain requirements. You can't just buy an office building and convert it, which a lot of people are doing. Uh, you really have to be very specific with what the needs are for the building. And um, this obviously was perfectly built for these needs given that it's a pharmaceutical building. And that allowed us to expedite speed to market. Uh, we are located in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, where there are over now, this slide is a bit dated. I got these stats from our Chamber of Commerce, but we now have over 40 cell and gene therapy companies in our region. We have 70,000 life science employees, 10,000 of which have cell and gene therapy experience. So because our company is both a CDMO and a property company, on the property company side, we see a lot of companies coming from around the world that are looking for space at our site. And one of the key factors is talent, 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 talent. How many people can I hire? How can I retain them? And Philadelphia is perfect for that. We have a relatively low cost of living compared to the other clusters. We are proximate to world-renowned medical and research inst institutions where Roddy is affiliated with at the University of Pennsylvania is the number one funded NIH funding research institute in the world, so or in the country for that matter. Um, so we're really lucky to be based here in Philadelphia um, with the transportation network and cold chain storage that exists in the region as well. Thanks. Next slide, please. Big Four Bio just get, did a great review of um, Philadelphia. Here are some additional statistics about our region. Uh, and we continue to have a robust ecosystem that really supports companies at all phases of its life cycle. UPenn is a really interesting example of an academic institution and in that they have Pennovation, uh, which is a great partner to some of the companies that are being started in academia. And there's a tech translation mechanism for taking those technologies and commercializing them. So it's fantastic that uh, we have that and some other research institutions in Temple and Drexel that are Jefferson um, and Jefferson Institute of Bioprocessing. It's a training institution that trains individuals in GMP manufacturing. So we really have this robust ecosystem here that is perfect for not only locating your company, but partnering with your CDMO. You can do that on our site. You can lease space and have your CDMO all located in the same location. Next slide, please. Here you'll see uh, an interesting graph. Philadelphia is number four in terms of uh, eds and meds, we like to call it, educational institutions and medical services, um, world-renowned academic systems, 20 plus health systems, 100 colleges and universities, and 1,200 plus life science companies. Thank you, next slide. 
So let's talk a little bit about Discovery Labs. We have a really interesting mix that we have both buy, where you can outsource to your CDMO, build, where you can build your own manufacturing, and a hybrid program, which is really for redundancy, um, in, all in one campus. We have attracted University of Pennsylvania um, has just leased two buildings on our site, the gene therapy program, Jim Wilson's team and their vector core is moving to our site, which is very exciting. We have Children's Hospital, Jefferson Health, Wuxi Biologics, Toso Biosciences, GSK, World Courier, which is interesting for transportation of uh, medical specimens, MedRisk and a long list of other uh, tenants, we have a very cur carefully curated list of, of tenants on that side. Our customers in the CDMO um, are confidential, but we have a really robust pipeline of customers and current customers that are working in both, which I think makes us very unique in that I believe I was tasked with speaking about the verticalization of uh, the cell and gene therapy space. And this slide really nicely lays it out in that we have this buy build strategies and the Center for Breakthrough Medicines not only has um, viral vector manufacturing, but we also have cell processing for cell therapy. Um, in addition, we have plasmid production, process development labs, analytical method developments. We have testing in-house so that you don't have to wait in line at the outsource testing providers and that we're able to do the full spectrum of tests for Lenti, AAV and cell therapy on our site. Next slide, please. Uh, here's what we announced yesterday and that the University of Pennsylvania gene therapy program is really an anchor tenant at our site, where you, which you see behind me. Um, and I really feel that this is a strong story for proof of concept for Philadelphia continuing to be a leader in cell and gene therapy. Thank you. Next slide. Another picture, a couple of pictures to keep you guys awake here with your coffee and photos. Next slide. <laughs> So here you'll see where the uh, site is located. It's a nice aerial view. The Discovery Labs is located just 20 minutes from Philadelphia. It's nice to be in the suburbs. A lot of the scientists are all living in the suburbs um, and not having to commute downtown. Um, and it really provides for interesting horizontal expansion and ease of transportation. Each uh, manufacturing batch, I think, has 30 skids of supplies and consumables. So the fact that you can have a nice warehouse in your backyard um, and easy loading and unloading, I saw that in Steve's picture, those nice loading docks he has. And it's really important for uh, viral vector manufacturing and cell therapy, given the consumables that are involved. And the quite, quite frankly, the complicated logistics that are, is also involved here. We not only own the um, legacy GSK site, we also just purchased uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer printing building, which is just down the street. That's another 600,000 square feet expandable to a million. And we previously own Innovation Renaissance, which is 600,000 square feet expandable to a million, uh, where we have both third party tenants and our CDMO, the Center for Breakthrough Medicines. Next slide, please. Uh, here's some pictures of Innovation 411. So not only do we have cell and gene therapy manufacturing and support space, but we also have a fitness center and a very nice auditorium. And the reason I bring that up is that um, our world is constantly changing. There's new therapies, new technologies being developed all the time. We are constantly doing training and development for our staff. So it's nice to be located in a site where we can do that for large groups of people, not just for our own employees, but really for the greater Philadelphia community. In fact, we had, a, I think it was 600 to 1,000 people at our site yesterday for an event. We did a tailgate outdoor in our parking lot where it was COVID safe. And it was for life science leaders all around the Pennsylvania area. And in fact, I think we had some out-of-staters. And so having this tremendous space on the amazing 300 acres that we're on really allows for interesting events for not just ourselves and our tenants, but for the greater community. Thank you. Next slide. Here is our campus innovation renaissance where we have some third-party tenants and we plan to do some self-processing there. Next slide, please, just being conscious of time when I have time for questions. And here's the Inquirer printing plant, which um, is an interesting story um, in terms of disintermediation and redeploying assets that are were used for, um, you know, previously sort of reading newspapers and going to cell and gene therapy, which is the next generation of technology. I think that should cover it unless I have an additional slide. I did want to um, you know, just point out 
that we also um, have a great team of people with experience from around the world. We recently started um, our chief operating officer, Jorg Algram, uh, just recently started from Lanza and Baxalta and Baxter. Um, and he ran, I think it was 30 plants around the world. And so we're very pleased to announce him joining our team. Um, and Sybil Danby recently joined our team from Paragon Catalant. Uh, Dana Cipriano from Wuxi, Aptech, who's running our testing operation. And we have a long list of individuals, not just from CDMOs, but also from innovator companies to provide the perspective of the customer. Um, and all of this, including what Roddy's doing and what Steve's doing, I would be remiss if I did not mention what we're doing is for the patient and for cures to those that are in need. There are children, Unfortunately, it's very sad that are dying in need of a viral vector or cell therapy. And bringing this capacity online will help those and their families. And we're just very, very pleased to be bringing that space to market, bringing the capacity, bringing the talent and the expertise to those who need it, the patients. Thank you so much for the time and happy to take questions with Steve and Roddy. Thank you so much. And just a huge thank you to our three speakers, Dr. O'Connor, Steve Godin, and Audrey Greenberg. We appreciate all of the insights you shared. And for the sake of time, we won't have uh, much time for Q&A, but what I can recommend is if you put in your questions into the Q&A chat, uh, we will keep record of these and then connect you with the speakers um, to answer the necessary question. So I will leave a few minutes and let you all um, put your questions into the Q&A widget. I have a question. Can I ask Steve a question? Absolutely. Steve, I, I loved your videos. Those were great. Um, I really liked how you showed the time lapse of the construction of your building. Um, did you guys use prefab at all or was that, oh, I love that your cat's walking behind you too. Uh, did you guys use prefab at all or was that all sort of built um, internally in the site? Yeah, it's all built internally in the okay. site. There, yeah, there, there wasn't any opportunity for prefab. Got it, okay. And man, I, I got to tell you, the campus that you guys have and, and, and are developing, we hope to one day uh, get to a, a, a fraction of that. It's, it's terrific what you guys are doing there. Yeah, and, and I think it's great what you're doing. I love the Columbus area. I love what Ohio is doing for companies there. It's groundbreaking. So the congrats to you and the team. Um, and uh, we're very familiar with Drive and Molly. We know the folks over there. So perfect. Yeah, congratulations. That's great. And, and to you guys as well. It, it's uh, great to have great companies uh, in the space that are out there to try to uh, fulfill the hope that so many uh, families uh, with children of rare diseases who have very little treatment options available uh, that, that you and companies like us are, are able to try to, to fill that obligation. Yeah. Roddy, we got a question in the chat and it might be interesting to hear your perspective because I know Steve and, my pro Steve and I probably have the same view, but what do you think is the most important bottleneck that needs solved in the next two to five years on the science side? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So, I mean, obviously I'm a little biased in terms of the cell quality so, so I, I think, you know, you can definitely see inefficiencies in terms of the length of time, for, you know, from taking the cells to, to you know, mod, gene modifying them, expanding them and putting them back in the patient. So that takes several weeks, you know, and you've got to hit the release criteria. I, I think, you know, Steve had a great slide with the bioreactor, um, you know, looking at it transformative or elixir, you know, if you could have a closed system or bioreactor, or a closed loop where you could take the, you know, T cells from a person, mm -hmm. modify them, and in, in hours, put them right back in and retain the potency. Wouldn't that be the best way? So I think we have to move beyond where we get our hands on them and nurture them for 14 days and 
you know, do too many testing and worry about quantity and, and just maintain that potency and get them right back in. And, and that'll benefit the patients with, you know, progressive disease. Yeah. And maybe even a distributed model, as long as we're sticking with autologous and not allogeneic, um, which may change things, you know, having on site uh, centers that can do it in hospital where you could just treat the cells on site is an interesting distributed model as well. Absolutely. Thank you all so much um, for, again, sharing your insights. And I will keep track if more questions come in. Uh, we are moving on to the experience portion of the event. Um, so we, we are very excited to introduce um, Greater Goods Coffee. We have Miranda Haney, uh, who is the head trainer. Um, so for our speakers, um, thank you all again so much for your time. Feel free to join us uh, for this part of the event, but we also totally understand if you have to hop. Um, we uh, look forward to walking through um, for the attendees still on uh, what's in your coffee pack and Miranda can take over from here. And uh, thank you again. Awesome. Thanks, Cece. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. My name is Miranda. Uh, I am here in Austin, Texas at Greater Goods Coffee. And today I am gonna walk you through a coffee cupping, uh, which hopefully maybe some of you have done this before, maybe it's your first time, uh, what to expect. So coffee cupping is the way we taste, evaluate, and compare uh, coffees in the coffee industry. So. We do this same protocol when we're choosing which coffees to buy, uh, when we are assessing quality control, and as people who enjoy coffee, maybe not necessarily coffee professionals, uh, cupping is a great way to enhance your palate and also just to be mindful, take a step away from the workday and focus on something that is has nothing to do with anything except all of the senses that you have uh, just right in your body. Uh, so we're going to get started. The first thing I want to do is um, unpack your box with you. Uh, so this is a webinar form, so please use the chat box um, to follow along and ask any questions. I have it open. I'm ready for you. Um, I'm going to go through how to unbox your kit if you haven't done that already. Um, so the first thing you'll see is, of course, your coffee. We have three different coffees from three different growing regions. Um, and they are all ground, so they're ground to be brewed the way that we are going to brew them. They will also be good if you put it in an automatic drip coffee maker. Maybe you got your kit and couldn't wait to try the coffee and you've already had a few cups. That's great, that'll be fine. Um, so we have three different coffees and I have set out on the table. I'm gonna start all the way to my left with Take Me Home. That is the lightest roast on the table. In the middle, I've got uh, the Rwanda. And then on the end, I have Good Vibes, which is the Brazilian. You also have three different bowls. So well, we'll actually, they're all the same. So you have three bowls. Uh, go ahead and sit those bowls out, uh, just three in a line like this. You also have a spoon that looks a little different than maybe a spoon that you've seen before. So keep that in handy, a cupping spoon. You have a flavor wheel that looks like this. This is gonna be like our word bank for the coffee tasting. Uh, just a helpful tool to give you some ideas of words we use to describe coffee. Definitely not the only way that we can describe coffee, but it is helpful. And then you have something that looks like this, which are our instructions. And we're going right off the instructions, so if you get lost at any time, number one, we are recording this session, so feel free to go back to it later. Also, we are going directly off the instructions here, so if you get lost, you can find us that way. Great. So other than my cupping kit, I also have uh, two additional spoons just from my kitchen here. So uh, regular old spoons will be fine. Um, I have a glass of hot water that is going to be used to rinse my spoons. I have an empty cup that is going to be used to house my spoons for now. And then in a bit, it's going to be used to discard my grinds. I've got a towel because things do get messy when you're in the kitchen. I have a scale. Uh, if you don't have a scale, that's okay. You can, well, I'll give you some measurements without a scale, uh, but that is helpful if you do have it. 
I have a timer or a stopwatch. So if you have your phone handy, that's fine too. And last but not least, I have some hot water. So to start cupping, the first thing you wanna do is get your water started. Now in coffee, the best thing you can do today to switch the way that you brew your coffee and make it better is to use filtered water. So if you have filtered water, go ahead and heat it up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit or right off the boil. Um, I have my water ready to go, so go ahead and get your water ready to go as well. And then the next thing you're gonna wanna do is take your cupping spoon and dole out two, he two heaping spoonfuls of each coffee in the order I just mentioned. So you can put your spoon right into the bag and put two heaping spoonfuls in each, uh, in each bowl there for you. Okay, so I've got Take Me Home on the left, Rwanda in the middle, that's the yellow label, and then the good vibes on the end. And as you open your bags, probably the first thing you're gonna notice or you're gonna wanna do is smell them. And perfect, that's exactly the right instinct. You're a coffee professional already. So take in the aromas there, really breathe deeply, and take this opportunity to focus on what you smell, if it's anything different from what you expected, and please drop in the chat what you smell in each coffee. So we're putting two tablespoons, two spoonfuls. If you have a scale, that's gonna be 12 grams. And again, that is right here on the instructions, folks. If you get lost, we heated up a kettle of filtered water to 200 degrees. Um, we're measuring out 12 grams of each coffee or two tablespoons. So whatever you have, you can use what you have. And really focus on what you're smelling. Nice, so feel free to drop in the chat what you smell in each coffee. For the take me home, it's pretty mild. Maybe you get a little bit of nuttiness or sweetness. You know, Rwanda is maybe a little tricky to smell anything, but maybe you get a little bit of fruitiness. And then the Brazilian, nice smoky flavor. Maybe a little bit closer to what, what coffee you have at home. Maybe you don't drink coffee at home. Um, does anyone drink coffee at home? And, and if you do, how do you, how do you brew coffee? Drop it in the chat for me. So I know you're there. <laughs> All right. Once I have my coffee uh, measured out, I'm gonna put my bowls in a place that is going to be easy to access them. So once we start adding water, we don't wanna move the bowls. We wanna keep them where they are. All right, I'm gonna pour my water uh, when you're ready, when you have your water. Again, we're going right off the instructions here. Uh, we're gonna start a stopwatch and carefully add water to each bowl up to the brim. So I have hot water and as soon as my water touches take me home, I'm gonna start my stop. So adding water to each bowl. You can listen to the sound of the water hitting the grinds, really focus on that. Focus on the way the bowls look. Video is frozen, oh no. Is the video frozen for everyone? No, we can see you, it's working. Okay. Yes, it's working for me as well. Thanks, Miranda. I am looking at that chat, so let me know what you taste and smell, please. All right, cool. So once I have my water added to each bowl, I'm starting a stopwatch. I'm counting up to four minutes, and we're just going to let these puppies brew. Uh, and while they brew, this is a good opportunity, too, to lean in and take in the smells. Uh, the, the smells you detect are going to change with time. So as these brew, as these open up, go ahead and assess your aroma. And you can't be wrong here, folks. It, it's very, since your experiences are really subjective, whatever you smell and taste is right. You can't be wrong. So trust your gut and don't think too hard. It's supposed to be fun. All right, so in my take me home, I smell a lot of caramel. 
maybe a little bit of light brown sugar. In the Rwanda, I'm starting to get some fruitier aromas. I can't quite figure out what fruit it is. Can anybody help me out? And then that Good Vibes has a little bit of cherry, but mostly a smoky flavor. So the reason these three coffees smell so different, and hopefully you were able to detect that, um, if not, you can always smell the back of your arm between each bowl to kind of clear out your palate and start fresh for each coffee. Um, coffee tastes different and smells different, largely because of where it's grown, number one. So we have Costa Rica. Costa Rican coffees are very sweet and mild. Uh, we have a Rwanda. African coffees are very fruit forward. And we have a Brazilian. And Brazilian coffees are going to be much more chocolatey, nutty. Uh, so they all already off the bat have different flavor characteristics. When we receive the coffee, it's actually green, and it is the seed of a fruit. So if you didn't know, coffee grows on a tree, and it looks a lot like a cherry. Uh, so farmers will pick that cherry off the tree, and then they have to remove the fruit uh, to get to the seeds that become our coffee beans. And that process of removing the fruit is called uh, processing. <laughs> so either it's honey processed, like our Costa Rican, which means the farmer depulped the cherries and then the seeds dried in the sun with the fruit juices on them. Uh, sometimes they're naturally processed, like this Brazilian, which means the, uh, the seeds dry right in the cherry. And sometimes they're fully pulped and washed, and that's a washed process. Uh, Brian asked, do they use the fruit for anything? Great question. So the fruit is called cascara. Um, and most often farmers use it to till back into the land as compost, but occasionally people will use it to make alcohol or uh, it's very bitter. It's a very bitter fruit. So sometimes people add uh, sugar and make like a tea or a cascara soda. If you've ever seen that, it does have caffeine in it. Um, even the fruit does so, but it tastes kind of bitter. Caffeine kind of tastes bitter. Um, that's a good question. All right. So once we hit about four minutes here, we're going to do what we call breaking the crust. So you should have noticed that some of the grinds floated to the top of your bowls, probably more so on your darker roast than your lighter roast. You should have seen that at least a little bit. So what we're going to do is take our beautiful cupping spoon and very gently, very gently, dip it into the surface of the bowl and push those grinds around the surface. So we're just breaking up whatever is sitting on the top of the bowl and then rinsing our spoon. We're gonna do this for all three. So even if you don't see a crust, still do this. Just go ahead and break it up there. This should also release a lot of aroma, so if you wanna get your face a little closer, careful not to touch your nose on the top of the bowl. I do that almost every time I cook. Nice. And our final preparation step, it's probably my favorite part of the whole experience, skimming the grinds. So at this point, we're gonna take these two extra spoons, put them together like this, and just drag them across the surface of the bowls really gently to remove any of that froth and grinds that are still on the top of the bowls. Uh, you might think, how am I gonna drink this with a cup full of grinds? And you're not wrong, we are gonna do that, uh, but we're gonna use our spoon. So we have to get rid of what's still on the top so that we can get to the coffee only and not have the grinds in our mouth. Uh, so I'm going to take my spoons like this, just very carefully drag them across the surface. Doesn't have to be perfect. Do the best you can. And when I'm cupping, I like to take this opportunity to take a deep breath, of course, always helpful. And then think about all of the steps that, went, that the farmer went through to get this coffee to us today. So it takes four to five years for a coffee plant to even bear fruit that can be harvested. So the seeds are planted and then four or five years later, the farmer has a uh, co coffee harvest. And the cherries are picked off the tree when they're the ripest red they can be. Then the fruit is removed or the seeds are dried right in the fruit if we have a natural processed coffee. They're dried in the sun for anywhere from 12 to 14 days. Then they're sent to a milling station 
where they remove any of the flaky stuff that's still on the seeds. They sort out any of the seeds that are the wrong shape or size or look like they may have gotten some insect damage. It's an agricultural product, people, very normal. And then after that long process, they are shipped to us uh, from Costa Rica or Brazil or as far away as Papua New Guinea. And they miraculously arrive intact and tasting great in Dripping Springs, Texas. We roast them. We spend a couple weeks dialing in the best roast profile for this coffee. And then we send it to you and, and hope for the best. <laughs> so that's the whole process that it goes through. Now, a lot of times when we see three coffees side by, we just think of, ca of coffee as a vehicle for caffeine, right? So this is a good opportunity to uh, enjoy the sensory experience of a cup of coffee rather than the caffeine that comes with it. Great. So I'm going to smell my aroma again. Mm, this, this Rwanda is starting to smell very starchy to me. So I, I think a uh, little, maybe like stewed peaches, apricots, something like that. And the good vibes is reminding me of campfires as a kid which sensor experiences are very closely linked to our memory as well. So if it jars a memory from your childhood, I'd love to hear that. Those are my favorite stories. So I have my handy dandy cupping spoon and right about at nine minutes or so, uh, nine, 10 minutes is when I like to take my first pass. Um, depending on how hot your water was, that kind of determines when you should do that, but use your best judgment feel the sides of the cups, and if they feel still too hot, don't sip it. Um, sometimes when we drink coffee and it's too hot, our palate is tricked into thinking it's bitter, but it's actually just super hot. So it's important to let them cool, not all the way, because coffee will change as it cools, uh, but enough that it's not unpleasant to our palates just because of the temperature. So to taste this coffee, uh, as the professionals do, like a professional coffee uh, quality control person. Uh, so if any of you are familiar with the wine world, you might have heard of a sommelier. Uh, today, you are all the, the sommeliers of the coffee industry, which is called a Q grader. Uh, so to, to taste well, I like to kind of step into the role of professional Q grader. And I'm going to try my best to taste this coffee and describe it. Um, anything goes, trust your gut. Last thing you need to know is to taste this coffee, we're gonna dip our cupping spoon gently into the surface of the bowl. You only need like half a spoonful and we're gonna slurp it. Now y'all are not, I don't hear you. You're in the comfort of your own home, so there's no shame. Uh, slurping sounds crazy, but it is, I promise you, the right way to do it. Uh, you just do it like this. <sighs> Ta-da. So you're spraying the coffee all around your palate. First time through, taste each one, just taste it once and make any initial judgments. So judge the coffee. What do you think? You like it? Or is this the first time you're drinking coffee without cream and sugar? Okay, cool. Welcome to the club. Let's see how it goes. Uh, so taste each one once. Make your snap judgment. <sighs> Hopefully right off the bat, you're able to tell they're all different. <laughs> and if your assumptions or your observations seem simple, that's okay. That's a great place to start. Just noticing the difference in the three, whether you can put your finger on it or not, that's okay. Okay, now I'm gonna taste each one. Uh, I'm gonna give myself a couple of, of seconds here to tell you, just kind of give you a bunch of flavors that you might taste. So taste along with me. Um, see if you can taste anything uh, that I'm saying. Also on the bags, you'll notice there are words, like for Take Me Home, we have toffee, marzipan, and vanilla. Uh, those are not added into the coffee, so no flavors are added into the coffee. Everything you taste is just because of where it's grown, how it's processed, and then how we roast it. So let's take Take Me Home, for example. This is our light roast Costa Rican coffee. It's 
So I like to sip the coffee, move it around in my mouth a little bit. I immediately think of uh, some kind of like wafer-like candy. So that could be a Milky Way or a Twix. It has that kind of like, uh, yeah, that, that wafer, that graham cracker kind of flavor. But then some milk chocolate as well. You can also think about how the coffee feels after you swallow it. Think about what's going on in your mouth. And really, it's hard to think about anything else when you're doing this, which is why it's so nice. And now you have all the tools you need to do this all the time. If you want to kind of take a break from, from life and just focus on one thing, um, very simple thing. So it's very sticky coating, really sweet and mild. Take Me Home is a Costa Rican coffee. Like I said, it is very, uh, those coffees are typically going to be very mild and sweet. So this kind of fits the bill really nicely. Next we have our Rwanda. So with this coffee, I get a nice bright acidity. So I taste it in the front of my palate right away. And then it kind of fizzles into the sides. And the finish is really like a, a barely peach. It's a very hint of peach. Is anyone experiencing any of that in the chat? Any flavors or even if you're having trouble, I'd love to hear some feedback. All right, and then Good Vibes is our last one. This one is a lot more bitter, I think. Maybe you perceive it in the back of your palate, a little bit on the sides. There's that, that nice dark chocolate flavor, a little bit of a cherry-like acidity. Another thing that we focus on when we're tasting coffee is the body of the coffee. So the physical feeling of the coffee in our mouth. So the next time you go through and taste, if you're not already super duper caffeinated like me, taste again. And also you never have to swallow the coffee when you're doing a cupping. A lot of professionals will spit the coffee out in a little like spittoon just to not get over caffeinated but still enjoy the sensory experience here. So when you're assessing mouthfeel, think about body. We're thinking about what's the physical feeling of this coffee in our mouth. So is it light and tea-like or is it more heavy and, and creamy? Uh, those are things that we, we would use to describe those. Great. And so that is pretty much the entire coffee. Uh, the Rwanda is my personal favorite. Cool, Brian. Me too. I really like that one. I think it's interesting, uh, a little off the beaten path. Uh, it's an interesting origin as well. We don't often see Rwandan coffees uh, in the specialty coffee industry. And that's something that we really strive to do at Greater Good. So we are a specialty roaster. Um, we roast all of our own coffee in Dripping Springs, and we really try to bring coffees to people from interesting places that maybe haven't been uh, necessarily hailed as specialty coffee regions. Um, and we also give back to our community. So you'll notice that as well on your bags. Each coffee has a charity associated with it. So the Rwanda, for example, we donate four meals to the food bank for every 12 ounces that are sold in Rwanda. Um, for the Take Me Home, that's going to be Austin Pets Alive. And for the Good Vibes, it's going to be the Autism Society of Texas. So we give back to our community. We're very uh, passionate about educating folks about coffee, no matter where you are on your coffee journey. Uh, if this sparked your interest, I hope it did. Uh, feel free to drop me a line at Miranda at GG Roasting. I love coffee questions. I am here to answer all of them. And you have everything you need to continue doing this process again. So next time you get a whole bunch of bags of coffee or you get coffee as a gift, uh, cup it on the table and see what you think. And uh, you could even try to do a blind cupping and have the, if you live with another person, try to see if you can guess which coffee is which. Uh, that's kind of a nerdy sensory thing that we do all the time here at our cafes. Um, but thank you so much for trying something new. And thank you, Cece and the team for having me. Uh, happy brewing. And if you have any questions, 